All right. We're good? All right, so uh, I'm Nathan Taggart. Uh, this is uh, Machine Learning the Hard Way, a uh, parenthetical a story about ponies. It's a true story. Uh, this is me. I'm on the internet uh, at ntaggart. I look like this because on the internet you can look however you want. And uh, this is me when I'm, I'm uh, betting on horses. Uh, uh, despite how it looks, I do actually have a job, a real job. Uh, I work at New Relic, um, which is awesome. Uh, New, Relic, uh, New Relic paid to send me here so that I could talk about ponies and not talk about New Relic, which is pretty cool. So if you want to talk New Relic, grab me in the hall, uh, and let's talk about ponies. So uh, I got into, into horse racing a few years ago. Uh, I, I got into it in kind of a roundabout way. I, uh, my friends sometimes make me go to Vegas and I hate Vegas because I hate gambling, and I hate gambling because I know math. Whoops, here we go. So yeah, um, so, so Vegas kind of sucks. Um, I do like to drink, and you can drink in Vegas, but it's super expensive, unless you're gambling and then it's free, but I know math, so. Um, so this is how I got into the ponies. It turns out if you bet on on the horses while you're at Vegas, they give you free drinks. Um, and so let's, for just a minute, explore drinking in Vegas with Python. So uh, a little bit about uh, how horse races work. There's about three races that run an hour for a given track. And uh, the minimum bet is $2 per race. So when we're talking about free drinks in Vegas, free is actually $6 per hour, it turns out. Um, which is only half true because you do win some of your bets. Um, in horse races, they withhold 20% of the pool, so you should only actually lose about 20% on average. So free in Vegas is $1.20 an hour. And I did actually track this. I get about 2.4 drinks per hour. So free drinks in Vegas cost 50 cents um, plus tips, you know. So, uh, so that's how I got into to horse racing. It's through drinking. And... Um, uh, when I started, I didn't know anything about, about horse racing, so I'm going to just assume no one here knows anything about it. Uh, it'll make it easier when we're talking about machine learning, which is the actual topic, uh, if we all have some kind of basic understanding of how horse racing works. So in a given race, there's about 10 horses that run. Uh, there can be more and there can be less, but 10 is kind of a good ballpark. Uh, the kind of betting we're going to talk about today is bets to win. So it's the simplest kind of bet. You pick a horse that you think is going to win. Uh, $2 minimum bet, and uh, if the horse wins, you win your, your money back, plus you get uh, extra money based on the odds. If the horse comes in any place other than first, you lose your money. Uh, this is kind of interesting. There's a many-to-many -many relationship between jockeys and horses. So one uh, jockey can ride multiple <laughs> horses, and a horse over its career can be ridden by multiple jockeys, although only one at a time. And um, Probably the most important thing to understand about how horse racing works is that the betting is what's known as parimutuel wagering. And so parimutuel means you're not betting against the house, you're betting against all the other bettors. Uh, there is a, about 20% that's withheld from the pool and that money goes to putting on the race. Um, so you bet against the other bettors, which means that the more you bet, uh, the more you can change the odds and you push the odds away from you as you bet. Uh, and then finally, the last thing to know about horse racing is horses have funny names. These are real ones. Uh, I'm not making this up. Uh, I saw this horse run a couple weeks ago, and um, I thought this was kind of fun. So uh, this is not a horse name. Um, now we're going to talk about <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, machine learning. Uh, and when I got started with machine learning, I didn't know anything about it. So I'm going to assume you don't know anything about it, and that's okay. Uh, there's basically two types of machine learning tasks um, that we're going to talk about. Um, so the first is classification. Uh, if you're doing some kind of prediction or model where you're trying to label uh, a data point um, with some discrete label, so for example, maybe we want to predict if a horse is a winner or if the horse is a loser, uh, we would use a classification technique. Uh, regression techniques are great for pr uh, predicting along a continuous range of values. So say, for example, we want to predict how many seconds it's going to take the horse to run. Uh, it could be 60 seconds or 62.3. We, uh, we're going to pick a continuous value, and that's uh, going to be a regression technique. 
Uh, it's also important to understand that there are kind of two approaches to machine learning, supervised and unsupervised. Today we're going to be only talking about supervised learning. And supervised learning is where essentially you take data uh, with actual solutions and you give that uh, to your algorithm kind of to train it. Um, then later you can show it data that doesn't have solutions and get solutions back. Uh, unsupervised learning uh, doesn't do this. Unsupervised learning, um, I'm going to turn on my presenter notes here. So, Unsupervised learning, uh, you can just give it uh, data that doesn't have any solutions and you get some new information about your data like whether there's any correlations or any trends or patterns in the data. Um, and then finally, when I'm talking to people who don't know a lot about machine learning, I like to remind people that we're talking about math. Algorithms are just math. There's nothing fancy going on. You could do all of this stuff by pen and paper. It would just take forever. So don't. Uh, use computers. Um, so when I started betting, I used a technique that I invented, and it's called the funny name strategy uh, trademark. And um, basically, I would pick a horse that I thought had a, a funny name, and then I would bet on it. And that was it. Like, that was the, that was the entirety of my strategy. Um, this, it, it's a fun strategy. It's fun, but um, it's, not always, uh, it's not always very effective. This, by the way, I would not have bet on this one, because that's, that's just terrible. Um, but I thought to myself that, you know, th there's got to be a better way than this, this thing that I made up. Um, and, and I started to look at it as I, was, as I was watching these races, and I realized that there are actually trends, there are patterns in this. It's not like totally random. And I realized that, you know, I really hate doing this poorly, so I'm going to try to do it well. Um, three things led me to think that this was very predictable. So one thing is that, um, you know, the horses there that are running, they're basically athletes, right? They train, um, they have health problems sometimes. Uh, some of them are naturally very, very gifted. Um, some are, are really bad consistently. Uh, and so that's kind of predictable. Like you, you start to follow a horse and you know that the, you know, it's a good one or it's a bad one. Um, horses are ridden by jockeys and jockeys are sometimes consistently very good and sometimes they're not so good. And horses um, are bet on by people and sometimes um, people are consistently good and sometimes people are idiots. So um, based on that, I figured that there were, there were trends and there were kind of inefficiencies in this market and I figured I could use machine learning to, to make money. Um, so this is, in my mind, this is how it was going to go once I applied machine learning to horse racing. Um, and and we'll, we'll test this theory. So um, what follows are 10 lessons that I learned the hard way and mostly the expensive way about machine learning. Uh, and I'm sharing these, most of these are embarrassing. I'm sharing them so that uh, you, you don't have to learn them the hard way. Uh, so I started out, I got, I had to buy data. So I just went out and I bought data. There's a company called Daily Race Forms, uh, DRF. They sell data on horse races, so I bought data. It costs $800 to buy a year's worth of data. They actually have 30 years worth of data, but I'm not rich yet, so I'm gonna. So I bought one year, which was kind of expensive. So if you're tracking, this is where I start out. So I start out in the hole, um, which is okay. I mean, it takes money to make money, I guess. Um, so $800 down. Uh, and I come up with a strategy, and this is my strategy. I think this was a good first strategy. Uh, I had kind of a hypothesis, and the idea was that um, the, the favorite and the long shot are overbet. Too many people bet on those. And since it's parimutuel, when too many people bet, it pushes the odds down, which means that the better place to bet would be kind of bet in the middle of the pack. Now, the reason I thought this was because, you know, if you don't know anything about horse racing, you might just bet on the favorite. That's a pretty reasonable strategy. Um, you also might bet on the long shot, because if you don't know anything about horse racing, then they're all, all the horses are the same. Get the one that, that pays you the most, I suppose. Um, and so I wrote a little script. It just kind of simulated. It ran through the data, and it bet. And uh, it told me if I had bet how much money I would have made. Uh, and it turns out I would have made quite a bit of money. So... Uh, you know, I did it, I was successful, and um, it's time to, uh, you know, I guess just go bet on and buy a jet and be rich and stuff. And so I, I stopped and I was thinking about like, what am I waiting for? I've got, I've got this technique and it works and I need to do it. And fake money is not as good as real money, so I started betting um, with my system. Now, the system doesn't tell me a specific horse is gonna be good. The system tells me an aggregate, there's a window I wanna bet along. And so, um, I logged into an online online betting site, which, by the way, is totally legal. You can bet on horses in the U.S. Uh, and I made blanket bets on 500 horses, uh, $2 a piece. 
uh, and the, all the bets were conditional that the horses had to have odds that were in my, my window. And then I just sit back and I'm going to collect my money and I'm going to be super rich. And I lost $200, which, <laughs> uh, which was disappointing. So it turns out that um, that was not successful. It was not that easy. Uh, which is lesson number one. So lesson number one is garbage in, garbage out. Here's the problem. I had no idea what I was doing. I just took raw data, came up with a, with a theory, and just started, um, started running with it. And it turns out I made a bunch of really bad assumptions um, because I did not understand the data that I was working with. So there were these fields in my data. Um, one was odds, and it was the odds to a dollar. And so what I did was I assumed that, like, you know, if the odds were in my, in my window, I would bet... Uh, and, and, you know, for simplicity's sake, I bet a dollar so I didn't have to do as much uh, conversion. Um, and then if I won the bet, I would just, I would add the win payoff to my pool. Um, the win payoff didn't come with a description, which was misleading, um, but it turns out that that was for a $2 bet. And when you bet $1 but get paid out as if you had bet $2, that is a very lucrative strategy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but they don't make that mistake at the track, actually. So I lost, I lost money. And I realize now that some of my assumptions were starting to be challenged. So I thought I would buy data and I would do a little bit of, of work to make it clean. And then I would just like write algorithms, which I didn't know what that meant exactly, but I figured that's how it would work. And then in the end, I would be super, super rich. And it would be great. And in reality, that's not at all how it goes. Um, this, is, this is really what it turned out to be. I spent all of my time working with my data, almost all of it. And then at the very, very end, I, I kind of tuned one or two algorithms that, that were effective. Um, and since all of your time is spent working with data, this is where I should really be starting. So uh, I had written this, this parser, and it was really ugly. So basically, uh, I took, I had a zip file from this DRF site. They gave me a zip file for every month of the year. And then in that zip file was a CSV for each day, for each track for the month. And then in each CSV file was a row for each horse that ran on that track of that day. And I, I built it into this like list of lists that had all the data about all the horses. And it turns out that that was just this horrible, unwieldy thing to work with. It ended up being like multiple gigabytes um, for this one object that stored all my information. And when you're working with this massive um, like pseudo array with multiple gigabytes, every time you try to do anything with it, it takes a really long time. So I was just kind of sitting there always waiting for things to happen. And whenever I'm sitting at my computer waiting for things to happen, I apply a solution that I learned uh, a few years ago, which is to buy a new laptop. <laughs> and <laughs> so I bought a new laptop, um, which is really lesson number two, uh, which is called what is munging? So what I really should have done is not bought a new laptop. That's, that's kind of a foolish solution. What I should have done is munged my data. Now in this context, and I know munging is used in, uh, with some kind of different definitions. In this context, what I mean by munging is all of the data processing techniques to take your raw data and turn it into data that you can work with. Um, and that means uh, kind of parsing your data, reformatting data. Sometimes that means discarding data that you're not going to use. It's not relevant maybe. Uh, merging data from different sources into kind of one format, um, and just basically, you know, taking it from ugly data to useful, usable data. Now, when I did this, I built my own solution, and it was that big, ugly array. Um, the, the better solution was just to work with NumPy and use NumPy's arrays, which are um, super uh, memory efficient. So basically, when you use a list of lists in Python, every single object or every element of all of the lists store a data type with that element. And for lists of lists, you can use any kind of, any kind of data you want. Um, for NumPy arrays, you can still use any kind of data you want, but each array can only use one data type. Um, and one of the advantages of that is that you don't have to store a data type for every single element of the array. You can just store it once for the entire array. And so that uh, immediately cuts down kind of dramatically on how much memory it needs to use. Um, and there's also some other efficiencies, especially um, when we start applying math to it, that make it just computationally more efficient. Um, so if I if I just started here, I probably could have uh, could have saved myself a laptop. I, it's a nice laptop. I don't mind, but uh, I did actually have to um, end up using NumPy arrays anyways, even after I bought the laptop. So th um, my array that I built was was not useful. NumPy's was, which brings me to this 
this conclusion that I, I had, which is you should never have to invent things in computer science anymore. Um, very rarely. If, if you're wondering if you should invent something, you shouldn't. Um, uh, and so I did, you know, my pool is, this is starting to look kind of scary because I bought this $1,800 laptop, which is, is great, but um, I'm noticing a divergence from what I thought would happen <laughs> and what's actually happening here. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not getting any, any closer to my goal of being super rich. So, um, so I brought in the big guns. Um, I did a lot of work uh, playing with a bunch of different machine learning libraries. There's a bunch out there, and some of them are very good. Uh, Scikits Learn is, is the one that I, I kind of fell in love with. Um, and there's quite a few reasons that I really like, like Scikits. For one, it works with NumPy arrays. Um, uh, by default, it also works with uh, sparse matrices, which turn out to be very, very useful if you have data that have lots of zeros in them. Um, but the, the, my favorite thing was this. It turns out that all of the classifiers, all the algorithms, have the same interface, right? They're, they're, all, uh, they're all very uh, similar. They have the same API. So I can actually comment out one and just redefine it, replace it with a different one, and all the rest of my code continues to work without any problem. Um, this is a very simple example of that, but when I've built out a really big uh, data processing pipeline, that becomes really, really powerful. Um, and then finally, uh, Scikits is super well documented, actively maintained, um, and everyone in that community seems to be really, really cool and helpful. So, uh, so I started uh, sort of looking around. I ended up there, and then I took um, I took this technique of you could just keep trying new classifiers, and I kind of took it to extremes, and I tried all the classifiers. Um, and some of them, most of them actually did terribly. They did not work very well for, for what I was doing. Uh, some of them took so long that I would just have to kill the process. I actually started um, spinning up EC2 instances to run them, run them remotely so I could just I could kill them off and not worry about it if they took too long. And then um, uh, some of them, one in particular, actually did really well. Um, it was very effective at a, a specific job, which was to predict whether or not a horse would win, this kind of binary output. Um, so I'm not the kind of idiot who's just going to start betting immediately. Um, so, <laughs> so this time I dug into it a little bit and I tried to figure out why it was working, right? Um, and it turns out that this one field, odds, which was the same one I had trouble with last time, this one field was almost entirely determining the output. So what I mean is if I took the odds field out of my data, my algorithm didn't work at all anymore. And if I took all the other data out but left odds in, my algorithm continued to work very effectively. And it turns out that the best predictor of whether or not a horse is good is whether or not people think the horse is good, which is maybe not terribly surprising in hindsight. Um, but what that meant was that since this is parimutuel wagering, everyone else thinks the horse is good, so it turns out that the horse is more likely to win, but when it wins, I don't get a very big payout. So you can assume if I, if I jump on board here and I bet alongside the, the larger group, we all have to split the smaller pool that's left over. So the ROI on that is really, really low. And so even though the horse is more likely to win, it's not so much more likely that I'm, I'm going to overcome these, these changing odds. Um, the real problem, though, was that I had this algorithm that was really only using one element of my data, right? This one element was entirely driving the output. And uh, that's, that's a bad sign because that means that uh, I have all this data that's valuable information that's not actually weighing into the, to the results. And it turns out this is a very, very typical problem. Um, and is lesson three. So lesson three is uh, that you have to standardize your data that you're working with. So this actually comes straight out of the Scikit docs, um, and it's one that I'll stop and read, which is, if a feature has variance that is orders of magnitude larger than the others, it might dominate the objective function and make et the estimator unable to learn from other features correctly as expected. So basically, I had this one feature that was entirely driving my output, and the problem was this one feature had a really large variance and um, tended to correlate strongest with the result. So what I really just needed to do was standardize. You can standardize and you could, we could take all the odds that were there and we could have just given them, say, a scale of 0 to 1 to give them kind of a ballpark how good are the odds and then left it at that. Um, and that would have worked a lot better. There's a lot of other pre-processing techniques we could talk about, but the important thing is that you can't just take the raw data and dump it into these algorithms. You have to finesse the data to work um, as expected. And again, these algorithms are just math, so if you're putting in wrong numbers or numbers that the equation doesn't expect, then you're going to get output that's not very useful. 
once I start pre-processing all my data, um, I start to, to improve. And I'm getting, you know, I'm still not super profitable, but I'm getting up there. Um, I was in kind of the low 90, 95% range of kind of what the expected return would be. Um, which is good, but the, the problem was I tried all the algorithms and I was now out of, out of things to try. Um, so I had to kind of stop and, and, and rethink about this. And I realized that I was putting a lot of effort into predicting which horse was going to win the race, um, which is maybe the wrong approach, because what I really wanted to do was, was uh, make money. And I don't really care who wins. I cared about making money. Um, so that's, that's an important lesson number four is to know the goal, right? I got very laser focused on the specific ob objective, which was um, predict the horse. When in reality, what I needed to do was make money. And there's tons of ways to do that. So for example, if I know with certainty which horse is going to win, yeah, I can go make a, a big bet on that horse. And that's one way to make money. But the other way to do it, and the way that, that turned out to be very impactful for me, was to realize that these odds imply a certain probability that the horse is going to win, and that there's a real probability of whether or not the horse is going to win. And so what I had to do is I had to find discrepancies where it was actually more likely that the horse would win than all the other bettors thought. And when I found those, those discrepancies, I could bet, and I could, I could actually play a little bit of arbitrage here, some risk arbitrage. And so what I needed to do was predict the real probability. And the way I did that was I predicted the odds. I predicted what the odds should have been. Um, and by predicting what the odds should have been, now I've gone from a classification problem to a regression problem which means that I have a whole bunch more algorithms I can work with, which was fun. Um, the problem is, these are the classifiers I worked with, and they took a really long time to go through all the classifiers. And I didn't want to do that all over again with all the re regressors. Um, and so what I wanted to do was predict which prediction technique would work the best, which I understand is a bit recursive. Um, and so, uh, so I started to go back to the docs and... Um, and that's really lesson number five. I called it why not to choose k-nearest neighbors, but really it's about how do you pick your algorithm. Um, and I found that as I talk to people about machine learning, especially people who are kind of new to it or interested but haven't done a lot of work, um, they tend to gravitate towards k-nearest neighbors as an algorithm that, that they would want to use. And the reason for that, I think, is because it's pretty easy to understand. So here's how k-nearest works. Is let's say we're trying to predict the value of star. Is it a circle or is it a square? Probably the easiest way to do that is to say, well, what's close to star and what are those? Are those circles or are they squares? And it turns out in this case, there's a lot more circles next to the star. And so we'd say, oh, the star is probably also a circle. Well, that makes sense. It's kind of easy to understand. Um, in this kind of low dimensional, low dimensional space, uh, you can visualize this very well. Um, and you can picture that we could, we could add dimensions the more, the more uh, features we have on our data. Um, the problem is this doesn't always work for all kinds of problems. So, for example, the horse that is most like the winner is all the other horses that ran with it, and they were all losers, right? Because um, these horses are, you know, they ran at the same track on the same day. They were probably about the same age. Um, they ran in the same weather conditions, the same track conditions. I mean, dimensionally speaking, these are very, very similar horses to the winner, but only one of them won. All the rest would have been classified incorrectly if we called them all winners. Um, so I went to the docs, and it turns out that uh, Scikit actually just tells you which one you should use. You don't have to invent this. Um, uh, so I went through this flowchart, and it turns out that the one that I should be using is called... SGD regressor, which stands for Stochastic Gradient Descent Regressor. Um, and so I open up the docs for that, and basically it says, this is exactly what you're trying to do, just use this one, uh, which would have saved me a lot of time. It also tells me uh, what uh, standardization uh, method I should use to standardize my data, what this uh, this specific algorithm expects for input. It also tells me it has support for sparse data, so I can use sparse matrices, which is really um, memory and computationally efficient for my specific data. It also is super fast. It's designed to work on a big data set. Um, and it has specific recommendations on how I can tune this algorithm to get the best results out. Um, so basically, like, it was all, I had to find one page in the docs, and I know there's a lot of pages, but that was it. That was, I had to find this one page, and as soon as I found this page, I learned everything. So seriously, read the docs, because 
Um, and I know this is kind of, this is a good general just programming lesson that I learned here. Um, I know enough about programming Python that I didn't spend a lot of time in the docs. And what I forgot was I'm not an expert in machine learning yet. And so I needed to go back and kind of understand some of the basics and get some guidance. Um, so read the docs. Um, while you're at it, if you see things that are wrong, write the docs, fix them, make a pull request. Here's some things that I found uh, in the docs that turned out to be really, really useful to me. Um, so my data, this is uh, horse sexes, and this was in my data. So the value on the left here is the actual label that was applied to my data. Uh, the value in the middle, this is the description. So, you know, we can say, uh, I had C in my data, and that stands for Colt. And so the first thing that I did, which was that I converted the letters to numbers so that I could run them through an algorithm. Um, but the problem is numbers have meaning, right? This is these aren't just different symbols. And a three is is actually has a specific relationship to one, and it's it's more than it. Um, and a filly is not really more than a mare. So this, this technique was, was obviously flawed. I caught this myself. I fixed this pretty early on. Um, the right way to do this is to create kind of a subarray. So we could, we could say there are eight positions, and they could each be you know, a zero or a one. Now we have kind of a binary array. And so I could say, okay, spade mare is a one in the first position and zero and all the rest, et cetera. So I went through, by the way, I had like 50 different fields in my data set, and they all had letters, and I had to convert them all to these binary arrays. And so I, I wrote logic to do that, and first I started writing it for each field, and then I realized, well, gosh, I'm reusing a lot of code, so then I abstracted it, I put a lot of work into it, and basically what I wrote was this thing that already existed, which is called the binarizer, and it's in the, like, it's there. I didn't have to build it. I wasted a bunch of time building something that was, and by the way, they built it way better than I did anyway. So, um, so I spent a lot of time um, doing this, which is kind of, kind of silly. Um, so uh, read the docs, learn about binarizer. The next thing, uh, the next thing that I learned was, uh, this ended up being super useful. I didn't know about this until I, I read it in the docs, and this was really, really impactful. You can actually make, uh, you can kind of extend scikit-learn to use any kind of scoring method that you want to use. Um, so in this case, you know, so, so scikit-learn provides a lot of different ways to, to test whether or not the algorithm is, is good or not. Um, for example, you know, what is the accuracy percentage? How many does it get right versus how many does it get wrong? Well, what I wanted it to do was I wanted it to simulate betting, right? I wanted it to, to bet uh, and then tell me whether or not that was profitable. Um, but that's not a choice in, the, in Scikit-Learn, so I had to write that myself. Um, but once I wrote it myself, this was great because now I could automate the entire pipeline. So I didn't have to sit there and figure out like how to tune all the parameters for the, for the algorithm. Um, once I gave it the score, I could actually just automatically try all the different combinations of parameters. And um, doing it with my score, I would get kind of uh, a high level uh, direction on, on kind of what ranges I needed to be in. Um, which, by the way, is another thing that I did not invent. This is a real thing. It's called grid search. Uh, there's an automated process for taking uh, various parameters that you might want to try and trying them in multiple combinations of them. Well, you can pass this a score, and when you do, then you, what you get back is actually uh, which parameter combination gave you the best result. So once I took all these techniques and I applied them to my, my data, um, I ended up uh, improving pretty dramatically, and now I'm just on the border of profitable. So it's like maybe like positive or negative a few percent for ROI, which I know doesn't sound super impressive, but keep in mind, like I'm overcoming a 20% withholding from the pool. So my estimation is actually 25% more accurate than just guessing would be at this point. So it turns out horses can be predicted. Um, the, the question is now, can they be predicted profitably? Um, and I haven't, I haven't found found that at this point. So one thing I tried to do was I tried to vary the size of my bet. I thought, hey, maybe I could apply a new, uh, a new approach, which is um, kind of steals from like a progressive gambling system, where when you lose, you just raise the size of your your next bet. So I did that. I uh, every time I every time I lost, I just bet a little more the next time, and when I won, I kind of reset back to back to my uh, two dollar minimum bet. Uh, and I tried it, and it actually worked. It put me out to 120%, which is not like a home run. Uh, but if I bet a thousand bucks a day, which I could probably do if I was working hard, 
I could make $200 a day, which is not a ton, uh, but is not horrible. Uh, I won't buy my jets. So I took, I took this, uh, this approach and I tried it in the market and immediately lost money again. Uh, <laughs> this, this one was probably the most embarrassing one. Um, so here's my lesson is, I know this sounds deeply, deeply cynical, but you're almost certainly wrong. Whatever you're doing is almost certainly wrong. Uh, you need to test your results. And here's why I say you're almost certainly wrong. Um, you're going to keep working on this until you get results that are successful. So all of the precursor results are going to be not successful. So you're probably wrong. You're going to get a lot more of those wrong results than you'll get right results. Um, and of course, in this case, you know, it's a, it's a gradient. You can be more or less right. But, um, but the important thing to do here is to validate. So I did validate my results. I validated them by losing money. But you could validate them in other ways, <laughs> some of which are, are less expensive. So for example, um, uh, yeah. Just curious. Yeah. Uh, did this uh, thing not work because of house limits, which is the usual thing that tells Martin Gale system, it, or was it some other reason? It, it actually didn't work for a different reason, which I'm going to cover, I promise. Yes. Um, yes, but that, that's why it doesn't work on like roulette or craps or something. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. The question was, did it not work because of, of essentially uh, boxing in how much you can bet at, on, this, on this game? which is how uh, casinos do it. So uh, one way to validate is to use uh, these kind of built-in methods. Um, this is uh, one that I found to be really useful. It's called stratified k-fold. Basically, um, you can just build this into your data processing pipeline. And the way that it works is it takes uh, all your entire data set and it, it folds it into groups. And then it withho withholds one of the groups and it uses all the rest to train the, the algorithm. And then it takes the one that it withheld, it plugs it in and it tests it to see how well it did. And then after it's done that, it just starts all over, but it withholds a different, a different component. Um, and by doing this, you can make sure that you didn't just get a fluke, right? Like it didn't just work with a um, specific subset of your tested data, that it will work kind of across the board. Make sure you're not overfit to your data. Um, so that's one, one uh, approach. Uh, another approach is to make sure that your data is shuffled. It turns out this was my real problem. So my data was ordered. There was an order to it. And the order was the date and then the track alphabetically and then the race number and then the position the horse came in. So at the first, uh, first position for each race was the winner and then loser, 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 and then finally another winner. And it turns out then when you're doing progressive betting like this, um, what I was doing is I would bet and I'd bet on the winner and I'd make money and then I'd, I'd lose a couple times all within one race, right? I'd lose and progress and progress and lose. And then I'd hit another winner in the next race. And they were so evenly spaced that it was very safe and it worked very well. It turns out in the real world, you can't, you can't do that because one, horses don't run one at a time. They, they run in, in, in groups of 10 or so. Um, but also it doesn't work because uh, you, you, can't, uh, you can't expect this kind of even distribution of wins, right? Your wins will kind of bunch and, and losses will bunch as well. So it worked on paper. It didn't work cleanly, which is lesson number eight. It's, it took to lesson eight before I learned this, by the way, is don't put, uh, you don't put all your money kind of on one idea. Um, you do actually have to eventually take your data out of the lab and go use your, your solution in the real world. That's how you actually validate. Um, but you don't have to do that all at once. You can kind of ease in. Um, for one thing, it's important to review your work with other people. So I was doing this in kind of my own little silo, which was silly. Um, I actually made the biggest breakthrough when I went and I talked to a friend of mine who works uh, uh, in finance. He works for a hedge fund. He's a quant. And um, he looked at my, my amateurish work and gave me a bunch of good ideas on how to do this better. And it turns out that even though I'm an amateur, um, I've been spending a lot of time doing this. And, um, and I started to kind of show other people. And the more that I taught people, I realized the more that I knew about this. And um, it actually kind of helped refine. You know, when you try to teach something, it kind of helps refine, make sure you really know it really well. Um, people ask you questions, and half the time you're like, oh, man, I don't know the answer to that. And you get to, get to look, um, kind of relearn and refocus on some of that. So that's lesson number nine. Um, we're, we're, we're almost to the end here. Uh, you know more than you think you know. 
make sure that um, you know as you're learning that you're sharing your information. And you can do that, you know, in, in easy places like Stack Overflow. Um, you can uh, you know talk to people. Uh, this this was great actually. The more I've been talking to people, people think that this is kind of fun betting on horses with Python. And the more I talk to people, the more people want to talk to me about machine learning, which is great because it helps me learn more about machine learning. Uh, there's also I found a great meetup locally for data science that. Um, has really uh, helped me learn a lot. I get to, to hear from interesting talks kind of every week. Um, also as a way for me to give back and kind of teach other people. Um, and I guess that's kind of the important part is that as, you, uh, as you're teaching, you're also learning. Um, and, and that's important. I think that's especially important in this, uh, in this field. Uh, you, do, you do actually know less than you, you think, and you, you can keep learning. Um, so kind of stay a student, experiment, and um, continue to challenge yourself. Uh, and you guys want to know how it turned out? Yeah. So it turns out I can profitably bet the horses now with Python for some definition of profitably. Um, it, it actually works, but it works only at a really small scale. So it turns out that um, I can make these tiny little bets and I can win money. Um, if I go out and I bet for a day, I might be able to pull in like, you know, 30 or $40, um, which is just a waste of time mostly. Um, <laughs> so here's what happens. It turns out like as you make bigger bets, it pushes the odds away from you. Well, I'm looking for odds arbitrage opportunities and they're, they're pretty small. So I have to make small bets. By the time I'm making like even 10 or, or $20 bets, that's enough to sometimes to, to make it so it's not as profitable. Um, so I make these tiny little bets, and I have to put a lot of work into, um, into making them because it turns out the odds change right up until the race starts. And so at the very last second, I've got to be like in there doing stuff. And I know I could automate some of this, but a lot of this just kind of takes someone, someone in there doing it. Um, so it takes a lot of time, and it kind of turned this into work, and it stopped being fun. And I have work, and it's fun. Um, and I wanted horse racing to be fun and not painful. So... I'm back to the funny name strategy, uh, which is really fun. You should really try it. It's good. Uh, I still get free drinks. And uh, most importantly, I learned uh, that this should be fun. So go out and uh, have fun with machine learning. Thanks very much. So he said we have five or ten minutes for questions. Should we? Ten minutes? All right. There we go. Yeah, go for it. Do you have a background in graphic design? Uh, I don't have a background in graphic design. Uh, so the question is, do I have a background in uh, graphic design, which is either really complimentary or really uh, derogatory? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think complimentary, but no, I don't. <laughs> which one did you use to make this thing? Uh, this is Keynote, yeah. Yeah. Guess in the pink? Yeah, so the question is, could you, could you get kind of a rough idea of what position the horse would come in and, and have a more sophisticated betting strategy? So I did, I did kind of simplify some of this, and I talked about only bets to win. You can actually bet that a horse will come in in the first two positions or the first three positions, um, which does offer some, some different opportunities to kind of mix it up a little bit. Um, I can, in fact, create kind of a probability chart of where a horse should come in. Um, the, the, the trick is that there's a lot more people betting to win than there are people betting, say, to show, which is the third place. And I'm already having a hard time getting enough uh, spread in the, in the uh, odds to make any size bet at all. And with place ones, it's even harder. Um, so I, I can do that, but it's, it's not as, it doesn't work in the real world as well as it works on in my simulation. Yeah, right here. I don't know if you're a science fiction fan or not. But, uh there's an author named uh, Robert Heinlein who wrote a book uh, entitled The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. And in one part of it, he has, he talked about a scheme for horse race betting, which was bet the lead apprentice jockey to show. <laughs> and I'm just curious whether or not your $800 worth of data actually has that information in it and uh, 
how his uh, algorithm would do if he was going to use uh, testing? Sure. So the, the, the question is kind of what, what data is included in the, uh, the data set that I bought? Um, what could it reveal? So it doesn't, in fact, include things like who the jockey is, who the owners of the horse are. Um, it did show some kind of interesting relationships between um, jockeys and owners. Uh, that, the slide that I had that showed that there's kind of a many-to-many -many relationship, there's actually a many-to-many -many relationship with affinity. So it turns out that jockeys build relationships with owners and are more likely to ride their horses. Um, so that shows some interesting stuff because uh, the jockey could be a very, very good jockey, but have a social pressure to ride a not very good horse. And so, um, so there were some kind of interesting discrepancies in the data like that. Yeah, go ahead. I was wondering if your arbitrage method could actually be used um, so actually in the casino. So you could get your free drinks as well as your profit um, increase. Yeah, so the question is, can I do this in a casino? And the answer is no. You're not allowed to have any kind of electronic equipment at the casino, including at the track. So I've gone to the tracks too, and if I pull out my laptop, they politely ask me to leave. So, yeah, right here. Did you look at how a perfor uh, horse performs over time? Yeah, so I did to some degree look at how a horse performs over time. So they do sell th this for every single year. I only bought it for one year. So all I can see is how a, perfor a horse performed over the year. Um, horses run on average about uh, six to eight times per year. And so there's not enough to really show like a great trend. Um, you do generally see though that uh, younger horses improve and older horses decline. Um, but that's about as, as deep as we got. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is more, and I think you're getting to the area of data science and analytics and you know, mm -hmm. all that. And can you talk about the level of uh, mathematical sophistication you need to do to do the algorithm? You know, yeah, that's a... Versus the amount of computer science. You're looking more at the algorithms and all that. Sure. Sure. So the question is, uh, what level of mathematics sophistication do you need to, to do this kind of stuff? Um, versus computer science experience. So I came to this with, uh, you know, I mean, I have an interest in math, but I, I, that's it. That's my experience. And I, uh, you know, I write software in Python, and that's my experience. Uh, and it turned out that I uh, had a hard, hard learning curve, but that um, I was able to do it, and I didn't really need to, a deep understanding of math. I think a deep understanding of math is helpful. Um, in the docs, for example, for every one of the algorithms, they actually show the math that goes into doing this. Um, for some of them, they're simple enough that I, I really could do it pen and paper, but some of them are over my head and they still work. Yeah. It, it seems like in, 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 in when they start looking, corporations and companies look for data science, they're looking for a pretty heavy level of uh, sophistication in the math. I don't know whether that's to make them feel comfortable. I mean, anybody can look at the odds, but you know, even the DS by a lot of those uh, statistical methods. Yeah, so. The, so uh, the, the question is, you know, it seems like uh, in the real world, uh, people who are hiring data scientists look for a heavy math background. Uh, it's, tr it's true, that does, that does tend to be the case. Um, what's interesting about this project that I did with horse racing is that I could iterate on it relatively quickly. So I could try something and then I could go bet, right? Um, in the real world, let's say you're trying to predict something like, you know, consumer shopping trends or something. You, you can't iterate that quickly. And so you can't be wrong as often as I was allowed to be wrong. Um, and so I imagine that, that that could be a reason why um, people don't like to hire data scientists who just like to mess around like I do. So. Were you able to correlate like horses to jockeys or track conditions or track wings or horse winnings or any of that? Sure. So essentially, am I able to correlate um, data? So I, I can correlate data. Um, one of one of the correlations that I found uh, really threw me off track. So I left this this anecdote out, but there was a field called U.S. Earnings Total. That was the name of it, and I took that to mean like historically up to this point, how much had the horse won in stakes. Um, and I was able to correlate a lot to that field. So I was able to correlate, uh, for example, that correlated very heavily with like owners. Certain owners tended to have horses that won a lot, right? Um, and so what you could what you could think is like, hey, if they buy a new horse, even if it hasn't run, I could probably already assume that's going to be a pretty good horse. Um, the problem was I found out after the fact um, 
that what that field was was actually how much the horse won for that particular race and so it ended up uh it was data that you don't have until after the race and so um it was good kind of for shaping my understanding about how horse racing works as an industry but it wasn't very useful for making a specific prediction so yeah i so you were saying that there's some data in there that you didn't have um, like the owner or something along those lines, and you only had it for one year, so you couldn't track the, you know, couldn't do the trends for the things. If it were, you had it all to do again, mm -hmm. and it was unlimited, did you speculate on what data would have been good or what you would, what you would have wanted to be able to make your model better? So if I could do it all over again, what would I, what would I do differently? Uh, and there are so many, so many answers to that. Um, so one thing that I would have, I would have definitely done uh, differently is I waited pretty late in the game to kind of only put data into my algorithms that I was actually able to put in on the race day. Um, some data was available, but it gets published, you know, maybe quarterly or something. And so on the day of a race, I, I just might not have the data. Um, so the, I would have started there is I would have made sure that the, you know, the inputs that I'm putting into my algorithm are all things that I'm going to be able to put in, in the real world scenario. I think that's, that's the, probably the biggest one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the question is, did I try back testing? Um, and yeah, so that was essentially what the simulations that I was doing, that's basically what they were, because this was all historical data. And so basically I was coming up with a theory and then saying like, historically would this theory have worked? And then I would convince myself it was a good theory and then lose money. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that, was, that was a separate step. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I did. I did do some back testing, um, and you know, a lot of these algorithms. That's ex essentially what they're trying to do. Is they're trying to find like a, you know some kind of pattern that's irrepeatable. Um. Yeah. Sure. So the question is, uh, it's called Zipline. Yeah. The question is, have I played with Zipline? I haven't looked at that. I'm pretty familiar with the Quando guys. Um, so I, I, I can't comment on how that compares with Scikit. Uh, the other algorithm, or the, I'm sorry, the other library that I really fell in love with was Pandas. Pandas is really great. Um, Pandas, I, I actually think, is a lot better with, with like some of the data prep work. Um, Pandas is, is good specifically for one task, which I had to do a lot, which is kind of imputing data, so filling in blanks. Pandas, I thought, was good at that. Um, Pandas works really well if you have time series data. Um, and to some degree, some of this horse racing data could be seen as kind of time series data. Um, but in general, I had a lot more success just being able to plug in, play, and try kind of different techniques with scikit-learn. Of the, the, this is winnable, is that what you mean? How, how much more convinced are you that it actually is one sided after your experiment gambling itself? Uh, yeah, so I, I do think that, um, so the question is, is, you know, is gambling still one sided? Um, I think it depends. So, so casino gambling is certainly one sided. Um, when I'm betting against other people, that's kind of like the stock market in the sense that I can be on either side of the bet. Um, and so in, in, some, in some senses, that means that, uh, that I, can, I could potentially play the, the side of the house. It could be two-sided. Um, you, you still have to be right, which is harder than it, it sometimes <laughs> looks. So, yeah. uh, so that's it for, for time. Thank you very much.